Okay. The bulb to the left, the smaller one, is only a 40 watt bulb, and a lot of you ask where I get these. This bulb is an appliance bulb. It's, it's the light bulb that you would see inside of a refrigerator or inside of an oven. So being that it's designed for an oven, you can still buy them. They're still available, and at least over here in the States, even though they're an incandescent bulb. And they're very durable, so they can take quite a bit of punishment. That's a, it's only a 40 watt bulb, so we're going to pretty heavily current limit this thing, testing it out. And when I turn it on, you'll see it should come on bright and then it should dim down. And we should see some sort of a current draw uh, on the, the little meter there. This meter here monitors what's sitting at this jack here, this connector. So we should see current there. And we're going to turn it on and see right now. Here we go. Perfect. And you can see how dim that bulb is. So that means there's no shorts. And that's a good sign. Now we're going to leave it on this current limit right now. And we're going to go over here and we're going to take some measurements of some voltages. So let's back up. And what we're interested in you can see the meter doesn't look like it always does normally. The one thing about a Fluke 187, I, boy do I wish they still made these. I would buy another one just to keep as a spare. Uh, but it can actually do AC plus DC measurement at the same time. It'll do a dual display. I don't believe the 87s will do that anymore. Uh, which is kind of cool because you can simultaneously look at the DC level of something and if there's any kind of ripple. So you'll see when we connect it that you can do that. Now of course you could toggle between AC and DC to, to measure those things, but I kind of like the dual display capabilities of this meter. And a, a lot of the lower cost, like Chinese meters, actually have this option on them. But uh, the flukes, now you have to get into the really, really expensive ones to do that. Well, I have an 87 here, let's look at it. Yeah, just like I thought. This, these do not have the AC and DC capability, the dual display. So anyway, let's check. This purple wire here to the left, looking at the schematic, should be 13.8 volts DC. And of course, since we're on that dim bulb, it's going to be substantially less than that. But it should be a clean DC signal. And it is. You can see 9 volts, and you just have barely, you know, millivolts of ripple, which is good. That's what we want. The next one is negative 13.7. And you can see it's negative. And the negative supply doesn't draw as much current, have as much load on it as the positive, so you notice it's a little bit higher. And that's okay. Once again, when we, get, when we get rid of the dim bulb tester out of the circuit, everything should come up. The yellow wire is supposed to be 240 volts, so I would imagine it to be in you know, 100 volt range somewhere. And it is 125 volts. And you can see very low ripple, that's what we want. The next one is a ground. And then these next two thicker wires, they actually contain your filament voltage. So in AC, if you read between the orange and the brown, you should see 7 volts AC for the uh, filament. And riding on that with respect to ground or to this black wire, you should see the high voltage, which is 680 volts. It looks like negative 680 on either side. So we should see, let's see what we got. And you could see 400, negative 421 and it should be about the same on either side. It shouldn't matter. And it is. See that? And there is some glare on there because of my light. But it's working and like I said I don't, we're still on the current limit but everything seems to be working properly. 
And by the way, that one wire that was, we couldn't figure out where it was, it's, it is the other side of the dial indicator light. And it goes right here on this return line here with this. And we'll zip tie all this and make it neat once we're sure that the power supply is working properly, which looks like it is. So I think we can let this thing off the leash now. And let's see what our voltages come up to. And let's hope that our fuses do not blow again. <laughs> so here we go. All right, full power. According to our little reader, we, we have 259 milliamps of current uh, draw for the entire receiver. So uh, that sounds reasonable to me. Our high voltage now, 600 volts, just the negative 600. So that's pretty much where they wanted it. Um, the 240 volts is still a little bit low. Our 13 volts, negative 13 is negative 13, and positive 13 is positive 13, so that's good. And I don't think these high voltage supplies are all that critical. They just have to be high voltage so that the CRT can operate. So I'm thinking that's okay. Uh, the other thing we can check to make sure we have filament on here, but I'm sure we do, or the that we would never have even had a dot on there to begin with. And we did see a little blue dot, you know, on the on the screen of the CRT. Hopefully, now again, that all has to do with the CRT. I don't think this power supply problem, but I could be wrong, uh, was preventing the stereo function from working or the quartz lock function from working. But we'll find out. But my guess is that this the display should be working now. Let's turn this around and re reorient the camera and we can check and see if we fixed it. Okay, we have it turned so we can see it and you can hear we have it and we look down here it's really dim but see the stereo indicator light it's going on and off so that part is working we didn't have that before but our pilot detect is working I'm pretty sure it didn't work so let's see if we can hear I know you can't because this is a mono, a mono microphone but I'm going to check. Yeah. Yep. The stereo is working. <laughs> wow, that's surprising. So really the only thing we need to do is we'll do our... Well, I have quartz lock turned off. Oh, look at that. It locked. Check that out. I had it turned off. So it's locking. Problem solved. So it was the power supply. All right, let's go down and see if our display is working. This is all good news. I didn't really expect that, I'll be honest. I didn't think it was just going to be that, but it's working. Okay, turn the display on. Remember the on and off didn't work. You just had, oh, look, check that out. If you remember before, we had this little dot there and uh, you couldn't turn it on or off, and now you can, and that works. Now, I think we need to adjust, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's see if we can adjust the, on the rear of the unit, the focus, and look at that, perfect. And the intensity, I'm gonna dim it down a little bit, doesn't need to be that bright. Okay, so let's see. And there's the audio, the tuning. And we should see that move as we go off center. See that? So let's turn that. Right on. 
on center and it quartz locks. So far so good. Let's, uh, let's take this off. Let's connect to our outside antenna. And it's not locking on this. And we are still going to have to do an alignment on this thing. For sure. And multipath. Okay. What do you know? Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> We're still going to do an alignment, obviously, but this thing is fully functional. And, of course, we have to do our evaluation on, uh, you know, how, how well it performs, but I have a feeling it's going to be okay. So, good news, huh? So let's look at some of the alignments and uh, wrap this video up. We shall commence our alignment with a cup of tea and a Pop-Tart. Now, anytime I do a uh, alignment on a tuner for the first time, I don't always have a Pop-Tart with tea, but I do go through and I look at the list of equipment that they're recommending and I kind of just read through the procedure how we're supposed to do it. And you can see it's they really want quite the list of equipment here. They want an AM signal generator with a test loop. We have that. FM signal generator and a multiplex signal generator and they're recommending the Sound Technology 1000A and I have one of those but again we are going to use the SG80 instead of that. Uh, they recommend an oscilloscope and it shows you what it's for. A frequency counter which we have one of those. A circuit tester a VTVM, which we have one of those, or a digital, so you can use either a digital or a VTVM, they don't care, just so it has a high input, input impedance. They want an AC watt meter and a line volt meter, and I think that's so that they want you to have the, your incoming mains be very accurate and they want you to use an auto transformer, a, a variac, to be able to set your mains very precisely. So I can tell just from that they're probably going to have some pretty critical alignments in this. Although the procedure isn't very long, it only goes on for a couple of pages, three pages to be exact, uh, I don't think it's going to be too bad. It can't be worse than the uh, you know, the, uh, what is it, TUX1 Sansui or the, uh, the Model 9800 uh, Pioneer tuner. So, I'm going to eat this Pop-Tart and I'm going to spare you the sound of me eating it. And we'll be right back. The Pop-Tart has been consumed, the tea has also been consumed and we're ready to begin. Now just getting a little bit organized here let's have a look at what they're telling us to do. And yeah the lighting is going to be weird on this because the camera does not like white paper with light shining on it especially from LED lights. I don't know why but it just gets kind of dark sometimes but we'll live with it. Of course we read through all of this and we get to step one of the very first alignment which is the AM intermediate frequency alignment or the IF. The first thing they do is say connect a sweep generator and of course nowhere up here 
do they talk about a sweep generator? So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Do we see a sweep generator here? I don't see one. Anyway, what they want us to do is they want us to sweep the IF circuit and look at the scope for a symmetrical response. Now, let's kind of look at what they're asking for. First of all, they're saying connect it to the R155TP and an alignment scope to the J207. So let's go to our schematics here. And I took this and I just enlarged the, uh, just this little section here so we could see it better. And we can see what they're talking about. And if we look, here is the test point of R155. So here's R155. And here's J, uh, what did I say, J207. It's hard to see because this is not a very good copy. And you'll see a lot of old schematics are like this. And if we go to the real deal here, we can see J207 is this post right here. And if we zoom down a little bit, you can see a resistor, R155, and it has the lead looped up around like a test point. So that's what I think they're talking about. So we're going to inject a signal. Now, what the heck is this? Why are they telling us to do this? Well, if we look up here, this goes into pin 12 of this chip. And the chip happens to be an LA1197, which if we print that out and look at it, an, an HA1197 is an all-in-one AM radio receiver. So all you need is the coils and capacitors and so forth. All the circuitry, as you can see here, is all built in. So we're going to inject a signal into pin, what is that, pin 12. Did I say 13? This is pin 12. And if we look where pin 12 is here, they're going to have us inject it right here. So what, we're, what I'm assuming they want us to do is they want us to put a swept 455 kilohertz signal and they want us to read it back out and they want us to get the most symmetrical looking waveform. So we're going to try our new MDO2204 <laughs> in the hopes that I will have good results with it. It does have a built-in signal generator. It has a spectrum analyzer, which we'll play with that later, and it has an oscilloscope. And we're just going to use the scope, and I'm not sure if I can, if this will trigger properly, because once again, uh, it just depends how we do, how, how this scope, I haven't messed with it yet. I know that I can do this with a regular sweep generator and with my leader scope, but we're going to try this first. Well, so right off the bat, we've got some problems here. Uh, this, this does not make any sense. The more I read it, and I've even tried it, it does not make sense. Why does it not make sense? Well, first of all, you're putting the signal in to this test point. See, it even says test point. And then they're telling you to put the scope to read it out to J207. And when we look at this schematic, okay, here, here's the test point they're talking about, where they want you to supposedly inject the signal. And then down here is where they want you to read the signal. Now, if we look very carefully at what this is, we go back to here, for instance, this is a direct line that we're connecting into down here, which is pin 12. And if we look at pin 12 on the spec sheet for that chip, pin 12 is the output. And this is where you're putting your distortion meter, your AC voltage meter, and so forth. So this is where you're reading out. So this is a gazauta, not a gozinta. <laughs> um, and this 
is connected to this coil which is your local oscillator and it's feeding into through this coil and up into pin 6 and if we look at pin 6 pin 6 is your local oscillator coil and it is connected to your tuning section so this is actually your goes into and this is your goes out of so they have it backwards now that being said they're telling you to connect a sweep generator and if if I hooked it this way it doesn't work at all you just see you see your local oscillator signal uh, with your scope and nothing else but if I take and swap these two around so in other words I inject the signal into J207 and I read it at R155 I actually can see something however if I use a sweep signal what you should technically see is you'll see a an audio sine wave that should be in step with your your actual sweep time so for instance it, most sweep generators will sweep at 60 Hertz which is 16.7 milliseconds so what you should do is if you center that to 455 kilohertz and then you sweep it so many kilohertz up and down like 10 kilohertz um, band spread and you sweep that at 60 Hertz you should see a 60 Hertz signal and you do but it's all distorted it has like some anomalies on it because there's other circuitry in there that interferes with it so I'm not really sure and and it does when you adjust these it does affect the signal and everything but it it doesn't it doesn't give you the readings that you need now they might have some special kind of alignment scope they're talking about like a genoscope or something but even a genoscope is nothing but a sweep generator with with an oscilloscope that tracks with it so none of this makes sense so here's what I came up with if we take our signal and we inject it instead of into 207 we inject it into pin 206 this is going to be into our RF coil. A 455 kilohertz signal will pass right through all of this because it's at the it's at the IF frequency, and we should be able to read our signal out here. We should see our detected signal come out here, and we should be able to adjust our um, up here our two IF circuits that way. And in fact, it does work. So back up to here now here's some of the things about this uh, MDO scope that I don't like the signal generator comes out the rear of the unit and you can see there's my wire to get into that you hit option AWG go to your output you turn select generator one turn it on I have it set to high impedance generator number one setup then we go to waveform, <laughs> waveform settings. Now you can set the frequency and amplitude and offset of your waveform. So for instance, I have it set to 655 kilohertz, which is an AM radio station, but I can also take this and let's say I want to move it to 455. I have to select that and then you use these buttons to scroll through the digits then you use this knob to select the digits you can see what a pain in the butt that is if this had a numeric keypad this would probably be one of the ultimate pieces of test equipment just because of what all it can do so I have this set to 455 kilohertz I'm gonna go back and I can go to modulation and it has AM, FM and fr frequency shift key so this has some rudimentary modulation in it it's pretty good and if I click modulation on and then I click on AM I can set the depth so I have it set to 33 percent modulation AM frequency you can select any AM frequency unlike like the 8657 
that we use, it only has one kilohertz and 400 hertz. You could set any AM modulation frequency you want. You can even set the shape of that. So you can sine square pulse ramp and noise. So this is a really good signal generator in this thing. I was really surprised. You can set the phase angle of it. So we have it set to a 400 hertz signal. Oh, and by the way, you can also go in to waveform, waveform settings, and we can set the amplitude of our, of our carrier. But you notice how many buttons you have to click to get to where you want. It's very menu driven and very time consuming, and you have to learn it. You get used to it, but to have an all-in-one device like this, you have to put up with some of those things. So, signal generator is doing its thing. And let's go back down here. And then the oscilloscope is right here. And then I can go into the spectrum analyzer if I want. I can hit spectrum analyzer. It'll show you that. But I'm not going to... This particular thing we're doing, we don't need that. We'll get into that maybe on another test. Okay. So let's get back down here. Don't you guys love all this stuff? Are you bored to death or confused or both? <laughs> I don't know. So here's the output. And I'm just using a little decoupling capacitor just so, uh, you know, so we don't put any kind of DC offset on the test equipment or on this. And then we're going to connect this, like I said, to J206 which is going to be your RF coming in, CJ206. I'm going to put that in here. And then where they said to inject the signal in, that's wrong, okay? That's a typo. You can measure it out there. Or, easier yet, I just connected to the output of the tuner with an RCA jack, and I connected it up here onto the scope and you can see it's a very weak signal because I'm only uh, because it's 455 kilohertz I really need a stronger signal than a hundred uh, than a hundred millivolts especially through that capacitor and everything but it works anyway if I do that and I go to the two IF cans they're telling you to adjust you can see I can peak it see it and in fact, the peak was ever so slightly out on both of these. So they're both adjusted. So if I go back down to here, here's our two adjustments. And you can see the little dot is where this was. So it's that much off here, which is not much. And this one was off right about here, and it, it used to be up here. So it was off by a little bit. Now, if I go back up here, and I go back into my signal generator, and I go back to waveform, and I go back to my frequency, I can set that to... 655. Why did I pick 655? Because I didn't have to scroll so much through all of this. It's in the range that I want. I don't have to go dial all these other. That's the pain on this. Changing frequencies is a big pain. You have to go back and forth and dial it in. But you know what? If you don't have a standalone RF signal generator, AF signal generator, so forth, this works. And it's clean. And it's a good signal. I pleasantly surprised by all of this. So now that we have that set, I can go down to the tuning knob here and I can tune the station on and off. You can watch me do that now. And when I tune right on to 655 meg or kilohertz, you could see I can walk it right through the, the peak there, see? And then I can, you know, we can tune it that way as well. So we're we can actually go in here and set all of our RF and IF settings this way. And it seems to be pretty good. Now the instructions going forward from there seem to make sense, at least a little 
better sense. Uh, but I still don't understand. For instance, it says on here, I'm, I don't know. I'm assuming, and this is again, I don't know, to do the frequency range tra and the dial tracking, they don't tell you where to inject the signal. They just tell you set an AM signal generator to 515, turn the tuning capacitor. So I'm assuming they want you to use the test loop and feed it into the bar antenna through the test loop. At least that's what I'm thinking they want to do. And it says use with AM signal generator. See, So uh, these instructions are not very clear, but at least that makes sense. So we can take this off, we can put our test loop on there, we can set the frequencies they ask for, and we should be able, the rest of it should work. But that IF, that IF instruction is, I'm not going to say it's wrong because they may be talk, referring to something that I don't understand or that I've never seen before, but I just know that <laughs> you can't do it, you can't blindly follow this direction or it won't work. Alright, so I now have my little test loop connected and it's just looped over top of the bar antenna and I haven't changed any of the frequencies or the dial settings here and you can see it picks it up perfectly. So what they want us to do now looking at this is the 515 kilohertz. So we want to set it set the signal generator and they want us to close the close the tuning gang the whole way. And that should be 515 kilohertz according to them. And so we're going to go into our signal generator again. Waveform settings. And this needs to be 515. So you could see I have to 515. See that? And you can see it is picking it up. So that means we're pretty close, and right there's where it's peaking out. And we're not right on 515. We're actually a little bit down here is where 515 should be. So they're saying the dial accuracy should be right down there, but we're not going to play with that yet because they uh, yeah they want the oscillator this is where they're gonna set the oscillator I'm gonna go to 600 kilohertz good heavens this is a pain <laughs> I'm doing this so that you can all see this thing how it works so 615 see that there's 600 kilohertz and I'm going to move this up to 600 kilohertz and it it is definitely off it's off the same amount as it was at the 515 looking at the dial and I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about here if you look down here that should be right at 600. I don't know if you could see that, but it's not. It should be down here and it's up here. So our local oscillator is off. So we're going to set it right down here, like they said, all the way closed. And then we're going to, and you could see, we're going to go back to 515 kilohertz. There we go. And we're going to adjust, according to this, we're going to adjust L152, which is your local oscillator adjustment. So L152 until we get a nice strong peak there. Okay. So that's the wrong way. about that right about there 
that looks pretty good. What we adjusted was this red slug down here. That's your local oscillator. Okay, now they want us to switch back to 600 kilohertz, or I'm sorry, 1650, and adjust the, it says, adjust the oscillator trimmer on the oscillator tuning capacitor for maximum audio output. So we're going to go back to here, back to here, waveform settings, and we want this to be 600, 1650. So, 16, 50. <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't know how much I'm going to use this signal generator in here. I will most likely just use uh, one of my external ones simply because it's such a pain. Tuning pointer at the high frequency end. And you can see as we dial through it, right there, we are not at the high frequency end. So right there is the high frequency end, so we're going to have to adjust the trimmer on the oscillator. Okay, it's much quicker to just leave the, <laughs> leave the setting up here. So I'm at 515, 515 kilohertz, and I adjusted the red slug. And you can see that's pretty much peaked out, and I'm all the way where they want it to be. Then we go back to... 1650 and we move the dial all the way to the other end and there it is and in order to, to set that they have you adjust the trimmers right here and yes none of them are marked so as it turns out the larger if you look at the at a tuning gang this is a this is a I think a seven or an eight gang tuner. This is a pretty good one. The ones that are smaller and further apart, which are lower capacitance, are for the higher frequencies. So then this one, the this, 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 and this, those are all for the FM band. The wider ones that are closer together like that are for the AM bands. And then when we look at the trimmers that go with those, the trimmers are over top. Of each one of those so for instance here's here's one and then the corresponding trimmer is right there and here's one corresponding trimmer is there and so forth so those three are the ones we're going to adjust to bring that in which is what I did it's very touchy so I'm not going to touch it again but it is now set properly and they were out not not a huge amount, but enough that it would throw your dial accuracy off. So there was a little bit of drifting. And I, I wonder if maybe the power supply was a little bit wacky on this thing for a while. And somebody tried to align it or do something. I'm not sure. But it's that part's on now. So we're done with that. Now we're going to go and we're going to actually set the, the rest of the RF tracking at 600 kilohertz and 1400. So now we're going to go to 600, so zero, 600. We're going to put the dial right at 600 and see how far off we are. And right there, 600. And boy, we're pretty close, aren't we? So let me look. They want us to turn the slug core of the AM ferrite rod antenna and the RF coil L151, which 151 is right here. So we'll adjust it a little bit. And it's, it was spot on. And the ferrite core 
these are always very difficult to do. I'll see if I can find something that's strong enough to turn it. Okay, I'm going to have to loosen the core up. I'll be right back. Essentially what we're doing is we're adjusting the slug inside here, and I set it, and it's very, very close. So it's kind of tough because this, this will crack very easily, and it's very stiff in there, so it's kind of tricky to do on camera. But anyway, it's dialed in. And there's our 1400 kilohertz, and it's perfect. It's right on, and if not, we would have had to adjust the trimmers again, but it's right on. And last, they want you to just adjust this pot with a 100 dBm signal, which I'm just being a little bit arbitrary with that. Uh, for a maximum signal, they want the trace to go from center up to the top. And you can see when we dial completely zero signal in the middle to full signal there, and it goes to the top graticule. So that's good. Well, this isn't very good beyond just the focusing being bad. Uh, if you look, there is a broken wire in there. And let's see if it'll focus. Let's see, there we go. You can see there's a broken wire. This whole thing's cracked and the wires are bad. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fix that or not, but I just noticed that. And it will affect at least tuning with, without an external antenna. This is messed up and it's not going to work right. So I may have to try to fix it or find a replacement. Okay, we are performing a little bit of surgery here. And these little wires are what's called LITZ wire, L-I-T-Z. And you can see where this one broke off right here. These ones are still intact even though the insulation has worn away. We're going to have to re-insulate them. But this one broke off. You can see that it's made of tiny, tiny little wires. And the idea is instead of having one thick wire they use many many strands of extremely thin wire because at certain RF frequencies you have something called the skin effect at some point in time the frequencies will travel across the surface of the wire rather than through the wire I know that sounds strange to those of you who are not into RF but it's it's true so the idea is these many thin conductors are a much better path for an RF signal. Now, LITS wire is only good at lower RF frequencies. At some point in time, the LITS wire actually inhibits the RF. So this is really something that you would see down in the AM band or the broad AM broadcast band. Or for ham radio, it would be in the HF bands. <laughs> So, or LF bands, or MW bands, I should say. So anyway, what I did was I tacked on this piece here. It's really not the way you're supposed to do it, but we really don't have much choice unless we want to rewind the coil, which I don't want to do. And I'm just getting ready to strip off this other end. And Litz wire is covered with cotton. It's not covered with plastic. And it is notoriously difficult to strip. So what I have found is easy to do is you get this cotton and you kind of just get it to puff up like this and then you bring it away from the wire as much as you can like that and then what I like to do is I just take my little torch or my little or a match or some heat source and I just go zip and it's gone <laughs> burn it right off and then that leaves a nice clean stripped piece of wire and we can connect this onto the terminal 
and the first thing we're going to, and it's very hard to wind it up. You could see how tiny those little strands are. And I'm just going to tin it just a little bit. There we go. This video is getting epic length. I never really intended this, but it just kind of went this way. Now we're going to put some insulation over all of these. Okay, that's much better. And I ohmed them all out and they all ring out okay. I put a little bit of graphite powder on the slug so it turns more easily. And we should be able to close this up now, provided that these come out. There we go. And there we go. Nice. Okay, now let's put this back together and hopefully it will behave itself. Well, there it is. It's back together. Hopefully it will hold up. Good heavens, you talk about a proctologist performing a root canal. Whew. <laughs> uh, well, let's try it again and see if it works. Yeah, too much of that will get me flagged, but works perfectly. Amazing. So, long, and, long story short, we have to change a couple of bulbs in here, it looks like. But we have the FM alignment to do, and I'm probably going to do that on another video. If you want to see it on video, please let me know down in the comments. If not, I'm probably just going to finish this up. And uh, that'll be that. You've seen me align FM receivers and so forth. But let me know. I, I'll, I'll video it if you all want me to. But everything's working. And actually, it wasn't a bad repair. I mean, we had to recap the power supply. We had to repair a broken wire in the antenna. And we had to do a little bit of alignment work and kind of figure out <laughs> the goofy instructions. But all in all, this, uh, this tuner is in extremely good condition. So I'm going to end this one here. And I'm going to wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And let me know if you want to see the FM alignment portion of this. And if so, I will. If not, we'll move on to the next project after this is done. Take care, everybody, and stay well. See you soon. Bye-bye.